Let me give you three scenarios to begin. Since following Jesus some years ago, you have a growing passion to work out how to be a living sacrifice, particularly in doing life together with other members of the body of Christ. From a distance, you have been watching the rise of national socialism in your country. But now its impact is close to home. Your sister's husband is Jewish. He and many others like him are being persecuted, imprisoned and killed. How do you submit to authority and love God? What do you do? Second scenario. You're a female university student in Bolivia. In view of God's mercy, your very fine mind has been working to be renewed through God's word and study with distinction. This semester, you've hit a really big challenge. Your lecturer will only allow female students to pass the course if they have sex with him. How do you submit to authority and love God? What do you do? Third scenario. You are the principal of a primary school in Canberra. You've applied yourself throughout your teaching career to love God and love others. A sixth grade girl in your school is talking with her teacher about being non-binary. Her parents are not convinced and do not want to encourage her. But she wants to begin wearing a binder, be known as he, and be called by a traditionally male name. The education department says that students over 14 are free to make their own decisions. But your colleagues want her to be free and follow her instincts. But this student is 11 years old. How do you submit to authority and love God? What do you do? So here we are in Romans chapter 13. In view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. Don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then in Romans 12, uh, the encouragement, exhortation to the church, that, that's the, the inner circle, the first of the concentric circles. Be devoted to one another in love. Bless those who persecute you. Don't repay evil with evil. Don't take revenge, but leave that to God. Overcome evil with good. And then you walk out the church door. It was hard enough living that way amongst your brothers and sisters in Christ, but now you walk out into the real world. A world of government, a world of tyrannical dictators, a world of my rules, and a world in which some of you are actually called to make the rules in Canberra and for Australia. How do you then live? Well, I've got three key verses for you this week. Verse 1, verses 9 and 10, and verse 14. Because as I've kind of reflected on this passage, I, I think they're all as significant as the other and they all go together. And as I've listened to other people wrestle through it, that's the conclusion I've come to. And here's why. Because this is, I think this is what the passage is saying. Submit to God's rule in the government he's established, but realise that salvation doesn't come through government. Remember that the ultimate law is the law of God's love. That's the highest law. It's not governmental. And ultimately... We're following the King of love, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our great leader is the Lord Jesus, who perfectly did what Romans 13 describes. <laughs> it's so wonderful. As we look at this passage, then think back to the life of the Lord Jesus. It's like, wow, really? <laughs> he nailed it. He perfectly held love and power together in sacrificial servant leadership. And that's actually the call on our lives, as hard as it is. So before I pray right now, I just want to really be careful in making sure I'm clear. Some of the things I'm going to say this morning are extremely challenging. I don't believe they are easy to do. But nonetheless, I think we are called into what Romans 13 is asking us to do as we follow the living and the loving Lord Jesus Christ. Please join me now. Let's pray that the Lord would help us actually listen and then work out how we're going to live this out. Let's pray. Father, we are just so grateful that you have established the authorities of this world and you rule over them. And you rule over them, calling us to obey your law of love. And we thank you for the risen Lord Jesus, who perfectly embodied 
how to keep love and power together and live them to your glory and for our salvation. So please help us, Lord, be clear so we can join him in that wonderful ministry too. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So remember, we're coming off the back of Romans 1 to 11. God's mercy hammered home because our forgetteries work much more powerfully than our memories. And we need to be very, very careful now that as we look at Romans chapter 12 and 13 and beyond, that we remember God's mercy. And we remember this is actually a call to us to consider how we should now then live. And the first thing that God's saying to us in chapter 13 is this, recognize that God rules through human authorities and submit to his rule through them for as long as that is possible. So have a look with me, Romans chapter 13, and we'll read again from verse 1. Romans 13 verse 1. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear, from the fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right. And you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it's necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. Um, so let's just be really, really clear on what's being said. And I think it's quite helpfully repetitive. Uh, but nonetheless, it's, it's, it's good to step these things out. Um, God has established human authorities for our good when they really exercise their authority in their God-given way. Rebelling against what God instituted brings judgment. Do what is right, obeying what God has established. And it's quite striking, isn't it, in verse 5, it's really, really clear Therefore, it's necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, well, that's one thing, isn't it? You want to avoid that, but also as a matter of conscience, because we're aware of who established these authorities. It's God himself, actually. So he's given us a call to honour authority. So before considering the outworking of this, I just want to be clear on what is not being said. Government is not God's means of salvation. And here's why it's important to be clear on that. Because for some of us, we might have a tendency to think, if Christians could just get into politics and if the government could work right, then it will be heaven on earth. No, th 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 there's absolutely no suggestion that that would be the case. John Calvin tried to operate a theocracy in Geneva in his time. It was a disaster didn't work, couldn't hold it together. But also another thing that's not being said, government is not Satan's tool. And this is, a bit of, this is a bit of a slap to those of us who are just full of conspiracy theories. The new world order, the days are coming. Uh, well, no, what, what God is saying here through Romans 13, no, calm down, calm down. No, no, God has established these authorities. God put them in place so keep them in their rightful place. And here's how you do it, verses 6 and 7. So good, so clear. Pay your taxes. Give to everyone what you owe them. If it's revenue, then revenue. If it's taxes, then taxes. If it's respect, then respect. If it's honour, then honour. He's simply saying, keep being good citizens within the social contract. It's quite interesting, isn't it, around the world, so many societies work like that. And which governing authority doesn't want citizens to do the right thing? And let me give you an example, really kind of maybe banal, simple example. I was on, uh, I think it was the bus one time in Florence with my two children. And the day before, I'd also taken a similar trip with my two children. I didn't have a ticket that day. And I was praying and hoping that an inspector wouldn't come on that day. And they didn't. But the next day, when I did have the ticket, 
there was a bus inspector. But before the inspector got on, I had decided that I would pay for the, tr the trips from the day before and the trips for today. And so the inspector, he grabs my ticket, checks it, and he says, Sir, you realise, how many people have you got here? And I said, three. He said, you realise you've paid for six trips? And I said, yes. And I explained to him exactly what I've just said to you. And this was his response. Complimenti. 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 You get what he's saying? Compliments to you, mate, because no one does that around here. He could not believe that someone was bothering not only to observe the law today, but making up for yesterday. Because Italians would not do that. And the reason why I did it was because I fear God more than people. But also, we've got to keep paying it round so it keeps going around. And Italy is a classic case where people constantly feel like they're being ripped off, so they rip off each other. And guess what happens? The laws increase to raise the taxes to get back the money that people don't pay. And guess what people keep thinking? I'm going to keep paying less because they keep making laws to raise the taxes to get more money out of me. <laughs> but what God's saying here is, hold on, if you want to be good citizens... Just keep sticking to the social contract. Sometimes that's really easy and sometimes it's difficult. But let me, let me give you an, a current example of how it's really easy, where human law aligns with God's law. The current legislation or the current argument, the current public discourse about consent. So just a, a brochure that I, my kids picked up, actually, but you can find it at the Arendelle Library where I was this week. So what's consent and how do we get it? Just reading, before any physical or sexual contact with another person, it's always necessary for us to ask or to be asked, would you like to do this? If the answer is an enthusiastic yes or sure or I'd like that, it means we have their consent to continue. If the answer is no or I'm not sure or the other person doesn't seem keen, then we don't have consent and it's time to stop. If the person is unresponsive or silent, it's time to stop. Yes! But let me, let me give you a bit of a bigger picture of God. what God has said about this already. God made them male and female. A man and woman will leave their father and mother. I don't know how it worked out with you if you're married, but it kind of roughly worked out this way for me and my wife, Sarah. I said, will you marry me? Then I asked her father if it would be okay if we got married. And then in the church service, which was held here, we were both asked, will you? And we both said, we will. And then the sexual relationship began. That's a pretty decent process of consent, wouldn't you say? It's strange, isn't it, that God seems to have had this all worked out a long time before we had to get back to it. But I really praise God for this. I don't think it's a bad thing at all. But it's so easy, isn't it, in that kind of situation to realise what God has joined together, let man not separate, because the whole consent thing has been really well and truly done. Hallelujah, that's good. But other times, human law doesn't align with God's law, does it? You might have recognised the first scenario that I used this morning was the experience of Dietrich Bonhoeffer in Germany. Now, in January of 1933, Bonhoeffer gave a radio address against Hitler, basically warning of this idolatrous cult that was arising in Germany. And then, a couple of months later... In April 1933, he was the first, jo first voice of church resistance to Hitler who was then making inroads against the Jews. And he's, Bonhoeffer said words like this, We are not simply to bandage the wounds of victims beneath the wheels of injustice. We are to drive a spoke into the wheel itself. And just to be clear, that was in the context when other German pastors were saying this, Christ has come to us through Adolf Hitler. Wow. And then Bonhoeffer went on to say, silence in the face of evil is evil itself. God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. He went on uh, to help establish the confessing church to preserve biblical and Christian orthodoxy. He founded an underground seminary where he illegally trained biblical leaders. He was part of the German resistance he was eventually imprisoned and hanged before the end of the war. 
pretty difficult in that situation to align with the government and continue to pursue God's law. But Bonhoeffer experienced something that we all need to deal with. <clears throat> and it's a way that others have described as a trilemma. And I'm taking a bit more time this morning in this talk because this is, this is Christian Ethics 101 and you are all living it. I'm, I'm pretty safe from this at the moment. There might come a time when what I preach uh, from a place like this would lead me to jail and hopefully some of you, you might even be there before me. Um, but you'll come and uh, help take care of me if I, if I do end up in that kind of situation. But we need to wrestle today to be prepared for that tomorrow. And this is the trilemma. Separation, so hiding away in Christian community. Accommodation, going with the flow or engagement. And this is how a guy called Lindsay Brown has described it in a book called Shining Like Stars, which documents the history and the experience of Christian students around the world with the, in, uh, with the, um, with the IFES. So let me just read it to you. I, I, I think he summed it up pretty well. The church has always struggled with its approach to the world, taking one of three positions. Separation. Here, Christians cut themselves off from the world, believing the only worthwhile activity is to evangelise or attend church meetings. This is what John Stott calls rabbit hole Christianity. Rabbits put their heads out of their burrows and then, if there is no one about, they race onto open land to find food and swiftly return to their burrows. Christians can be like that, dashing to Christian activities with minimal contact with the world. This breeds a hit-and-run form of evangelism, not to be despised, but not the best way to reach out to people. It assumes the world is intrinsically evil. Accommodation. Here Christians urge that we should simply join in to the extent of becoming like the world. This can lead to an indistinguishable lifestyle. These people spend, tend to speak little and rarely about the glory of Christ. You could describe them as baptising the latest secular notions with Christian meaning rather than challenging the non-Christian worldview with biblical principles and biblical teaching. This perspective usually arises together with a liberal theology that sits very loosely with the Bible. But then there's engagement. Here, Christians seek to engage with society. Christians are to be morally distinct, but not socially segregated from the world. To be in, but not of the world. This seems to be echoed in Jesus' high priestly prayer in John 17. I pray not that you will take them out of the world. As you sent me, so I send them. It is difficult to engage with the world while retaining our saltiness, but that is what we are called to do. So here's the first step, just as I round out my first point. I think it's to realise, like I said before, government is not God's means of salvation. Okay, So we're not, not overcooking that idea. Government is not Satan's tool, so our job is not to be a rebel force that actually takes the government down. God put them in place, so let's keep them in their rightful place. And so it's a bit of a segue into the second point. I think we're working to honour government until it no longer honours God, and then we must be ready to make a Christian choice. Okay? So we're honouring government until it no longer honours God, then be ready to make a Christian choice. And in fact, that's what we're working on this morning, to be prepared for that. And I know some of you already find yourselves in it. So how should we then live? Well, we realise God rules through his law of love, which never, ever goes away. Have a look at verse 8. I'm going to read from there. This is Romans chapter 13, verse 8. And it's a really cool play on words, right? Because he's just been talking about paying what you owe. And then he says, Let no debt remain outstanding, except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other command there may be, are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbour as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbour, therefore love is the fulfilment of the law. So sometimes government and God coincide, sometimes they collide, but God's law overrides human legislation. The one law that never goes away is love God because he's the one who gives the commandments and love neighbour. And that's what we've signed up to, right? In view of God's mercy. <laughs> if you're taking the mercy, how, how do we live it out? Because God's unmerited grace and unconditional love in Christ, they restore a relationship with himself and each other. 
and it demands our unlimited response in loving God. That's what God's law was always about. So there's no end to it. It's a great expression, isn't it? Let no debt remain outstanding except the debt to love. Because we can't really. How much have we been given in the Lord Jesus Christ? There's just no way we can ever repay that. Because loving God is the obedience that comes through faith, so trusting him and being obedient, it maintains, it doesn't harm relationship with God and it maintains relationship with each other. That's what those commandments are all about. And let, let me just tease that out. Love is sexual faithfulness in marriage. Adultery actually breaks down what God created and the promise that people have made to one another as they marry. Love is preserving not killing life. Murder destroys relationship with God and people. Love is respecting another person's possessions because coveting when I really want what my neighbour's got turns my neighbour into a competitor <laughs> and me potentially into a thief. But already I'm a thief in my own mind when I want what they've got because I'm just thinking about all the time how I can get it even before I might do the act of grabbing what they have. And it's certainly going to break the relationship. Love. So we can't say, can we, love is love is love. <laughs> Remember that? <laughs> Vacuous, self-referential, meaningless. And I'll give you an example. I remember reading an interview with the movie director Nick Cassavetes and he was being interviewed about a movie that he'd recently made about incest and putting incest in a positive light. And I'm really, really sorry to say, if you search out movies on incest, there are so many of them. It's like, wow, really? And Nick Cassavetes, in the, in the course of this interview, some, of the, some people are starting to object to the, the topic and he said, wait a minute, <laughs> love is love is love, right? Isn't that what we're saying? Who can say anything's right or wrong, right? So if I make a movie on incest, if they think it's love, then that's love. But we can't say love is love is love because the creator of the universe tells us actually what it is. It's trusting obedience that listens and obeys his voice, honours him, stays in relationship with him and honours our neighbour to stay in relationship with our neighbour. Let me take you back to the second scenario that I started with this morning. Anna was a university student and a volunteer staff worker at the same time. One of her professors would not give her a past grade in her subject until she had sexual relationships with him. Anna refused to sleep with the professor and he refused to award her a past grade for several years running. Now, I think this is a John 19 moment, actually. Remember the first reading that we've had this morning? Jesus says, you know what? You wouldn't have any power um, except for what's been given to you. <laughs> and he fully recognises that, but at the same time, he submits in, in that moment, but opposes the power. And this is our sister Anna in Bolivia, years ago now, actually realising the same thing and pursuing the same course. And she says, you know what? I'm honouring God. Sex is for marriage. I don't covet or idolise education. I don't covet or idolise career. So I'm not just going to step down that easy path and sleep with you because I see what's on the other side and that's what I want. I really want to get it. She says, no, I won't let you steal my virginity. I won't let you be a thief of my dignity and therefore you can do with me what you will, but I'm trusting God. <laughs> and she's actually loving this guy by not allowing him to break the Lord's commandments with her. And let me read further how this shook down. Eventually, he gave her the pass grade, realising he was not going to wear her down. And have a listen what this sets her up for. After passing the exam, she got a job in a clinic which turned out to be full of corruption and carried out illegal abortions. Courageously, she wrote a letter of resignation explaining all her reasons for leaving. The owner of the clinic telephoned her a few days later I do not accept your resignation. Would you please stay? The owner went on to explain that he wanted her to become director of the clinic. He had been so impressed by the reports he had heard of her, and get this, and of the way she was weathering the criticism and disdain of her senior colleagues, that it caused him to ask questions and to reappraise his own situation. 
did he really want to make money from a clinic that had had such little regard for its patients? See how this spills out? A righteous decision on the part of this woman who says yes to God, says no to this guy, loves the Lord, effectively loves him, and sets her up actually for being able to bless other people as it goes on. So she can set a path of integrity and loving her neighbour because she doesn't idolise what God doesn't want her to love. So good. Let's bring it a bit closer to home. And some hot topics for us at the moment, because it'd be wrong of me just to kind of um, leave it so distant. Abortion. And I, I, I just want to acknowledge this morning, for sure, in our congregations, there will be people who, for different reasons, have had to make decisions to have abortions. But what we're dealing with here is, into the future... How would any one of us, but then how do we as a community actually seek to live in a society that's starting to say, you know what, whenever you want to abort, right up almost to delivery, you can, you can do that. But we say, no, God works on a different trajectory. So I, I think it's pretty simple to say from what we've heard in the passage this morning that love is preserving life, not killing it. And what we want to do is ensure that that's the case. But in loving our neighbour, this is, I think we want to go many steps further down this track. It's not good enough for any one of us to demonise those who are pregnant in, in whatever situation, especially if they feel like they need to abort the child. But what we need to say is, look, God loves life. He wants to preserve the life of your child. We... If it's occurring amongst us, we want to make sure that you know the grace of God, the forgiveness of God are reconciled even into this community and some of us will adopt your child. And we will make sure that there is a path that you can follow knowing that there are no mistakes with God, that what he loves is preserving life, not killing it. And so we will ensure that that's possible for you. Because it's no good us just kind of pointing the finger and telling everyone else what's right and what's wrong and then kind of walking away and washing our hands. That's not loving our neighbour. But what about the third scenario that I started with, gender dysphoria and transitioning? How might we think about that? And again, brothers and sisters, I know that you are in this. And like I said at the start, I want to repeat it again. This is not easy. Please do not hear me saying for one moment that this is so easy, okay? But we must wrestle with it because here's the rub. When the government is making a law and God's law of love is coming into conflict with that, there's the tension and some of you are right in the mix of that, for sure. But what do you do? But not just what do you do, what do we do? But then what does our society do? Okay, and that's why why I want to touch on some of this stuff this morning. Well, I think just off the back of what we've heard already in the passage, we want to say, don't we, God has a purpose actually in gender, in sexuality, that's kind of mentioned a little bit in this passage in terms of marriage and not committing adultery. So we want to say, God creates biology. God determines sexuality. And maybe if I just want to press into that not coveting, because I've done a little bit of research in this, you you would want to say to, to some of the beginning feelings of gender dysphoria are you coveting something you don't have (laughs) so of course it's one thing isn't it to talk about that in as a church community and and i know brothers and sisters that some members of your family have have experienced this they're experiencing this they've made decisions based on uh, some of their feelings but also what other people have told them and they have transitioned okay It, it has happened amongst us and it will And there will be those amongst us who experience these feelings. But what the Lord's saying to us this morning is that wrestle with what love actually means and where that comes from. God's saying he determines it for his glory and for our good. And just on this topic of gender dysphoria and transitioning, I want to refer you to this book. Irreversible Damage by Abigail Schreier. She is a secular journalist in North America who who tripped over this phenomenon by accident, didn't really want to keep pursuing it, 
read her book because what she would say is at least wait, wait. Because what's happening, I think in line with some of the things that uh, God's talking about in preserving a relationship with him and with each other, is in the phenomenon of many young girls wanting to begin the transition is that it's breaking relationship with their parents. It's breaking relationship with their families. They find their digital tribe online and that's the people that they pursue. So is it a loving thing? No, I don't think so in in terms of the commandments that we have here. But ultimately she would say stop because there's lots of research on the other side of all this that's saying it's not working. Okay, but I want to put it to you because you need to chew this over and many of you are dealing with this in your families and in your occupations and some of you are in a position for making about making decisions for our society <laughs> and so you need to be working on being prepared so one last word on how to deal uh, with this situation i want to recommend another book to you which i found really really helpful it's called love is an orientation by andrew marin at a certain point in his life within the space of 18 months three Christian mates all came out as gay and he decided that instead of demonizing them what he would do is walk with them not to compromise his following of Jesus or to keep trying to point the finger at them but actually to be in their world but not of their world and his example is a tremendous example of the benefit of doing that thing so perhaps there's an approach for each of us It's not separation, it's not accommodation, but it's engagement with the Bible open. So last point, why should we then live this way? Well, because God rules through the Lord of love, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's going to become really, really clear on the day that he returns to save and to judge. But we have to live now to be ready for then. And it's quite clear, isn't it, in verses 11 to 14. And do all this, understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armour of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, but in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desire of the flesh. Again, it's a call to understand, so let let your mind be transformed, let your life be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And he says a pretty simple thing. Wake up. Get dressed. Um, Live as in the daytime, not as though you're in the night. So, Live in the light of the dawning brightness of Christ's coming. What he's talking about is the time of salvation that's coming, the time of judgment that's coming, all based on belief in Christ. It's it's an interesting thing that he says, the time is nearer than when we first believed. So the future is based on faith in Christ and being judged in light of that. And then he says, get dressed, put on the armour of light, clothe yourselves with Christ, leave aside the deeds of darkness. Don't think about how to gratify your basic instincts. Uh, It kind of reminded me of something I heard uh, a little while ago. Tesco in England had begun to ban people turning up in their pyjamas because apparently there uh, there was a little increasing phenomenon that people would just think, I'm just ducking down the shops. So they would do it in their pyjamas. But there had to be signs placed everywhere. No, this is not acceptable because you're in the supermarket, not in your bedroom. I do remember a time actually uh, <coughs> turning up to work dressed incorrectly, but it wasn't any fault of my own. I was training on the way to work with the Canberra Cycling Club. We were um, doing repetitions up and down Black Mountain, and I left my bag with all my work clothes at the bottom. And in between leaving my bag there, going up and then coming back down, someone had stolen my bag. So I turned up to work in Lycra. And th- those were the days before it absolutely became very, very common in camera to not either wear cycling gear or um, active wear, right? It felt really weird to be walking around the office with my cycling gear on. That's what he's saying. Look, you've just got to be aware of the times 
you've got to be aware as Christian people of what's of your back marker, which is the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. There's God's mercy and what you've got in front of you, which is his return. So you're living in the in-between times, the now and the not yet, the overlap of the ages. So get rid of the things that just aren't part of either of those things. But I think it's a really cool moment for us to reflect on because of this. When you're living in a situation where the government is saying one thing and the law of God says another, you're going to be under tremendous pressure. And what's the temptation? Well, maybe just to take the edge off with a bit of a drink. Or maybe just to lose yourself in sexual behavior that just doesn't fit with what God wants. Or maybe, almost as a result of those things, just to find yourself in dissension and jealousy and doubting yourself because of the effects of those two things. Let me. So I think there's a logic here in what Paul racks up. Carousing and drunkenness, they've all got to do with alcohol. Sexual immorality and debauchery can often be grown in that space where alcohol is leading us. And dissension and jealousy, I think, come off the back of those things. So there's a logical sequence here. Listen to this definition of jealousy. A feeling of unhappiness and anger caused by a belief that a loved one might be unfaithful. Well, he's just kind of described it, hasn't he? Sexual immorality and debauchery. Feeling of unhappiness caused by wanting what someone else has, qualities or possessions. Yeah, when we're under pressure, we're just grasping, aren't we? We're looking at all sorts of things. And what he's describing is just stuff that will ruin relationship with God and with others. Now, remember the context. This is not about being a good person in view of God's mercy. Be devoted to one another. Living in a world under human authority, but God's rule of love is the override. It's going to put pressure on you. It's already putting pressure on you. It killed Jesus, and if they crucified him, do you expect anything less? Let me finish with these two points of application, and I'm going to read from the Scriptures. I reckon if we look back in Christian history, we see this cycle. There's fascination. It looks so good. There's attraction and people buy in, but then there's persecution because the person at the center of this is actually opposing the world. And so there's marginalization, even for that person, and I'm talking about Jesus, and then his people. But when his people are persecuted and marginalized, and they're actually getting what it means to live a life of love, society looks out there and they say, you wouldn't mind a piece of that. And it's very attractive because it's very, very good. And guess what? It comes back into the center again. It becomes mainstream. But then when people really get what Jesus is on about, the cycle repeats. And Ian reminded me of something an Archbishop of Chicago once said. He said, I will die in my bed. My successor will die in jail. His successor will die in the public square. But his successor will rebuild the church and society. It just happens that way. And we shouldn't expect anything less, but we must be prepared. Another book recommendation, Steve McAlpine, Being the Bad Guys, came out a, a year or so ago in Australia. He's an Australian author, and he's just simply saying, what's it going to look like now that we're the bad guys? He says, well, nothing's going to change, actually, because that's what the scriptures tell us to expect. Suffering actually accompanies the path to glory. The Lord Jesus understood it completely. But he says this, in the critical moment of Christian decision... You can't take out of the bank what you haven't put in. Okay? And here are his check questions, his faithfulness check questions. What actually goes on in your private life and in my private life? How is my prayer and Bible life? What do I watch and read? So, so what, what am I filling myself up with? How do I handle criticism? And, and how much am I actually on about criticizing others? And here's the kicker. How much influence does work have in your life? And how much is your identity about Jesus or is it about job and pay and career? So I spoke with a brother about this, this last week and it was really, really helpful, his comment. He said, look, I think in Australia at the moment, 95, 96, 97% of laws we can easily follow. No problem. But he said, maybe that 2 or 3% that's 
coming in. And we feel it first through education. It's always the way. But for some of us, that critical moment is coming and you will be asked, is loving God and loving neighbour more important or is hanging on to your job? And do you know what I've got to be ready to do when you're faced with that question? I've got to be ready to pay for your survival and welcome you into my home. (laughs) Because I want you to stand for Jesus. That's what he wants and that's what he did for us. Let's have a listen. I'm just going to finish 1 Peter chapter 2 from verse 9. It's so good. It just really ties all this together. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you, as foreigners and exiles, to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that, though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorance talk, ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honour the emperor. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Please join me. Let's pray. Um, Lord God, we're here before you today, not because it's easy, but because it's good and really, really right. We love your grace to us in the Lord Jesus. Thank you for your mercy. We ask that you grow us as people who are able to be living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to you. Father, we acknowledge that there have been moments uh, when we've been in front of hard decisions and we found that difficult. We ask that you would help us to keep looking at the Lord Jesus and understand how we live in a world where you've established the authorities, but the law of your love overrides that. And help us to live, Lord, in a way that that looks to the Lord Jesus, expectant of his return and ready for it. Uh, And I do pray, Father, as a community, you'd help us to grow in our conversations even now, Lord, this morning, as we chew through these things and wrestle them out. In Jesus' name, amen.